Nehemiah chapter number 8. And in Nehemiah chapter number 8, Nehemiah has gone back to Jerusalem out of captivity. He's rebuilding the walls. The walls are broken down. Everything's a mess. He's trying to fix it. They called for Ezra. Ezra was the scribe, and they told him to bring the book of Moses, bring the Bible, and we want to hear the word of God. And Nehemiah 8.3 says he spoke from morning until midday. Sounds like solid rock, doesn't it? Huh? And uh, in verse 4, it says he stood up on a pulpit of wood. So they had a pulpit, and they had the Bible. And I thank the Lord for that, that we have a pulpit, and we have preaching, we have the word of God. And uh, the Bible says in verse 6, all the people answered, amen, amen. So that's kind of like, that's right, that's right. And uh, they lifted up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So there was true humility and worshiping God and praising the Lord. And this was just a great day. And in verse number 10, Nehemiah said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat. Man, he's a man after my own heart. Eat the fat. Drink the sweet. It's getting better. And send portions unto them whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. This is the day we hear the word of God. This is a special day. This is a great day. Well, guess what? We're hearing the word of God today. And we got a pulpit and we can say amen and lift our hands and praise the Lord. And it's, it's a great day. It's a special day when you get to go to the house of the Lord. He says, neither be ye sorry. Don't be sorry. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord. And I want to preach about that today. Father, please bless this message. Lord, help us, God. Encourage us. Bless us, Lord. Touch us. We give you all the honor and the glory today and all the praise and the worship. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my message is my message, The Sky is Not Falling. Back in 2018, I preached a message and used that title. And I'm not preaching the same message, but... Uh, I am using the title, title again. Uh, do you have the joy of the Lord? Are you a joyful person? Uh, I don't know what you have going on in your life. I don't know. Everybody's got their burdens. Everybody got their cross to bear. But we need to have the joy of the Lord because the Bible says when we have the joy of the Lord, we're strong. And if we don't have the joy of the Lord, we get discouraged and we get down and we're easy pickings for the devil. And you're easy pickings to get defeated. Over in Proverbs chapter number 17, uh, Proverbs number 17, verse 22, and uh, I, I went from 19 to 16. A merry heart, Proverbs 17, 22, doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Having joy is a good thing. Uh, you know, your, your spirit can affect you physically, and it does affect you physically, and your physical well-being can, can affect your spirit. Look over in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 13. Talks about a merry heart, having the joy, having the joy bells ringing in your heart. Maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. The spirit is broken. I think you know what it means to have a broken spirit. I mean, you can, you can be on the mountain one minute and you can be in the valley the next. Over in Matthew chapter 16, the Lord says to Peter, Blessed are thou, Simon bar Jonah. And I preach about this in the tent meeting. And right in the same page, he says to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You're an offense unto me. So Peter went from being up on the mountain to going off the cliff. And it's easy. It just, it doesn't take much. We're living in some hard times. We've got COVID going around. I got done preaching this message this morning and Mike Scardino says, have you heard about monkeypox? How many people heard about monkeypox? 
I didn't hear about monkey pox. I heard about chicken pox. So he goes and tells me there's something else coming around. We got the COVID, we got the variant, got all this junk going on in the world. And the economy, oh my goodness, I was talking to uh, Jeff Bringhurst. He has a butcher shop right down the street, best meat in the world, put an advertisement in for Jeff. And uh, talk about chicken, how much chicken's going to cost. You know, you know what this is? This is a chicken graveyard right here. <laughs> My favorite chicken, fried chicken, broiled chicken, boiled chicken, any kind of chicken, baked chicken. Anyway, I'm off track. I... <laughs> but the economy, I went in the shop right last night. I had to buy bags to put my groceries in. And I bought a loaf of rye bread. My wife likes rye bread. $4.95 for a loaf of rye bread. That's enough to get you off of bread, man. Politics, the craziness going on in the country. There's, listen, there's a lot of things can drag you down. I mean, you get your, you just, I've stopped listening to the news about 15 or 16 months ago. I feel so much better, it's not even funny. I mean, you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not a hermit, I can't do that. I just, I mean, me listening didn't change anything anyway. But it's, it's better for my spirit not to listen to all how bad it is. All the gloom and the doom. I'm just saying there's a lot of things that can pull you down. But despite all that, we need to have the joy of the Lord. The Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And it lists nine different things. And the first one is love. And the second one is joy. So if you're going to have the joy of the Lord, number one, you've got to have the Lord. You've got to be saved. But number two, you've got to be walking in the Spirit. And let me just say this. We need to keep our eyes on the Lord. No matter what's going on, you remember the story, everybody knows the story about Peter. They're out in the boat and they're rowing and the storm is going to come over the side of the boat and they're going to die. And all of a sudden, here's somebody walking on the water. Now they're more scared than they were before because they think it's a ghost. And Peter sees it's the Lord. He asks the Lord, he says, can I come out on the water with you? And he starts walking on the water. And then the Bible says he saw the wind boisterous. He got his eye. You know what he did? He took his eyes. The, the wind, the storm, it distracted him. All, and you know what? Our problems, if we're not careful, all we'll focus on is our problems. And it'll distract us. It'll get us away from looking to the Lord. And he began to sink. You got, if you're going to have the joy of the Lord, you've got to keep your eyes on the Lord. Now, let me get back to, and let me just say this. You can't afford to lose your joy. David, his sin stole his joy. And he praised the Lord in Psalm 51. Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He just wanted to get his joy back. So, Chicken Little. How many people know Chicken Little? I like big chicken, not little chicken. <laughs> but Chicken Little, Henny Penny, Golden Books, back when I was a boy, back in the covered wagon days. And... Chicken Little was out scratching in the garden one day and an acorn fell and hit Chicken Little on the head. And Chicken Little said, the sky is falling. The sky is falling. So she ran and found Goosey Woosey and Chucky Ducky and all her friends. And she told them how the sky was falling and they all believed her. And they all went with her to go tell the king that the sky was falling. Now, the sky was not falling. And no matter what's going on, the sky is still not falling. And God is in control. She exaggerated the problem. She made it worse than it was. Because you know why? It was real to her. In her mind, the sky really was falling, even though it wasn't falling. So my point is this. We need to stay positive. If you are not positive, if you don't have a positive attitude, you're not going to have your joy. Let me say that again. If you don't have a positive attitude, I don't care if you're saved or not, you're not going to have the joy of the Lord. You'll have your salvation, but you won't have the joy of the Lord. Philippians chapter 4 
Very familiar chapter. The whole book of Philippians is a joy chapter. It's about the joy of the Lord. Paul uses the word rejoice eight times in that little four chapter book and he uses the word joy six times. And I mentioned this in the early service. If Paul, he wrote Philippians from prison. If he can have the joy of the Lord in prison, you can have the joy of the Lord in New Jersey. And so can I. Here's what he said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, listen, which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then he says this, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You know what that is? I'm not uh, Norman Vincent Peale. I'm not trying to be just positive, positive, positive. But that's a positive statement. Here's what he's saying. Think about the things that are right. Think about the things that are good. Think about the good things. We've got a lot more good going on than we do bad. I have three illustrations, and I believe most of the people in this room have seen all three of these before. I've used them before. So don't call out, but what do you see? Well, everybody would say, I see a dot. I see a black spot on the, on the white paper. And our, our, our mind goes right to that spot. What am I looking at? I'm looking at a black spot. Well. There is a black spot on the paper, but there's a whole lot more paper than there is black spot. And you know what we do in life when there's a problem, when there's an issue, our thoughts, our mind, all of a sudden we're, we're focused on that thing that's wrong. We're focused on that thing that we don't like, that thing that's pulling us down. I, I preached this message at 8 o'clock, and right after I preached this message, I had three different conversations that would like broke my spirit. And it's as hard to, for me, even just to refocus on the message I'm preaching. So we need to be careful that we do not do that laser focus on our problems. Remember this, God is bigger than your problem. God is bigger than the problem. And we're in God's hands. God is in control. There is nothing that happens that God doesn't allow to happen. There's nothing that happens that God couldn't keep from happening. So we need to remember that. This is a great, probably pretty hard for some of you to see it back there. And this is, believe it or not, a raisin. And it's very small, right? Raisin, great, great raisin. One time, this raisin looked like this grape. But you know what happened? The raisin lost its joy and it dried up. That raisin is a dried grape. Seriously. Now, the Bible talks about if we don't have a merry heart, We'll have a broken spirit and we'll be dried up. This is a glass with water in it. And you know the old story. I'm shaking. I'm not nervous. I just shake all the time. I shake when I sleep. Um, is the glass full or is the glass empty? Well, the glass is half full. And the glass is half empty. It's both. It's half full and half empty. But as far as you're concerned, it's just the way you look at it. In other words, you can look at this glass and be positive and say it's half full. Or you can look at that glass and be negative and say it's half empty. And either way, you're right. Philippians 4.13 says this. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. 
If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. It all depends how you look at it. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, the Lord said this. In the world, you shall have tribulation. That's not good. And then he says this, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You know, he says, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. Well, that's pretty negative. But you know what the Lord does? He turns it around. And he says, doesn't matter. Be a good cheer because I've overcome the world. The world says, you live a hard life. Life is hard. And then you die. The Christian says, life may be hard, but then you go to be with the Lord. And there is a difference, believe me. We have a lot more to be positive about than we do to be negative about. Amen. The Bible says this in Psalm 33, 5, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. It's just like that white paper. Hey, listen, there's a, there's a whole lot more white paper than there is black spot. And you have problems and I have problems and you have weights and I have weights and you have burdens and I have burdens. But I want to tell you something. Listen, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Amen. God's good all over the place. God isn't good just in one spot. Psalm 27, 13, I quote this all the time. David said, I had fainted. I wouldn't have made it if I hadn't believed. It's my faith that got me through. I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now we talk about how heaven is going to be so good. And heaven's a wonderful place. And there's no sin and pain and sorrow and tears. And I understand that. But listen, this world is good. I'm not talking about the sin. I'm not talking about the evil. I'm talking about as far as God is concerned. God is good. Psalm 34, 8, taste and see. The Lord is good. Can't you see? Do you understand? Do you experience the goodness of the Lord? God got me out of bed this morning. You, I can see. I can hear. I can feel. David said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all days of my life. And then he said this, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David didn't have an easy life. David didn't have a charmed life. But he still was able to say, the Lord's been good. So number one, be positive. If not, you'll lose your joy. Number two, don't be negative. Negativity will drain you. You with me? Negat you know how you drain a battery? I mean, if you're on your phone too long, you, you drain all the energy out of it. Negativity will drain you. It'll just drain your spirit. We need to be positive. I told people this morning, I'm, I'm cautious by nature. Brother Charlie runs, jumps in the swimming pool. I run over there and make sure there's water in there first. <laughs> using a little, using him at expense of my jokes. He got beat up on her tent this week. But I'm cautious. But now listen, it's good to be cautious, but you need to be careful because there's only one step between cautious and negative. You with me? There's, only, there's, a, there's a thin line between cautious and negative. We're only one step away. Back in the day, the weatherman used to come in and say, it's going to rain tomorrow. Now they come in and they say, 40% chance of rain tomorrow. They can't lose. They covered their bets. Excuse the expression. Well, let's, guess what? There's a 60% chance it ain't going to rain. So everybody hears them say, 40% chance of rain tomorrow. Up, oh, going to rain tomorrow. Better get your umbrella. No, I, I'm not going to believe it's rain until I see the rain. We've had a lot of stuff going around here where it was going to rain, but it didn't. John chapter 6. I'll read John chapter 6, verse number 8, if you want to turn over there. And... Uh, in John chapter 6 and verse number 8, one of his disciples, Andrew Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? There's 5,000 men, and they're following the Lord, and they haven't anything to eat, and he wants to feed them. And Andrew says, Well, there's some kid here, and he's got a little lunch, but what good's that going to do? You know what he had? He had a negative spirit. Because the Bible said Jesus took that bread and he fed 5,000 people and had 12 baskets left over. See, listen, with man, 
There's a lot of things that are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Only believe, all things are possible. So, number one, stay positive. Keep your joy. Don't lose your joy. Don't become negative. The next point is this. Don't get critical. Don't get critical. First, you start out positive. Then you become negative. The next thing's going to happen, you're going to get critical. You're going to get critical. What does it mean to be critical? Inclined to find fault. Inclined to find fault. More likely to see what's wrong than what's right. People come to church. You know what you get when you come to church? You get what you're looking for. If you come here to get a blessing, you'll get a blessing. If you come here to be critical, there's plenty to criticize. I mean, it's just, it's just that simple. You can, you can have two people sitting in the same row and one person gets a blessing and the other person goes out looking at their shoes. It's, a lot of it has to do with, with our, our heart condition and our attitude and our spirit. We, do, we don't want to become critical. In the Bible, the most critical people in the Bible were the Pharisees. These Pharisees, listen, they, they lived, lived a very moral life. They, 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 uh, they tithed, they, they were in the synagogue, they did all kind of right things, but they had a wrong spirit. You never saw a happy Pharisee. They were never celebrating, they were never rejoicing. To the Pharisees, listen to me, everything was wrong. Everything was wrong and nothing was right. When you get critical, that's going to be your view of life. That's going to be church. That's going to be the job. That's going to be the family. I mean, that's going to be everything. Now, I know there's a lot in this world that we don't agree with, especially as Bible Christians. And if you have a biblical world philosophy, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on, and we don't necessarily have to agree with it. But we need to be careful that it doesn't make us critical people that we see everything wrong because everything isn't wrong. They had a help wanted sign up at Chipotle's. It said, happy people want it. Happy helpers. Half the people in this room couldn't get a job making burritos. <laughs> the Pharisees, I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 12. The Pharisees always missed the blessing. They always missed the blessing. They always found something to criticize. They all, no matter what Jesus did, they always came back with that critical spirit. Because listen, that's all they could see. They could not see what was right. All they could see what is wrong. Children that grow up with criticism are probably going to have a critical spirit because criticism is contagious. In Matthew 12, in verse number 10, there was a man which had his hand withered, and they asked him, the Lord, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? So here's this man, he's got this shriveled up hand, and they said to the Lord, is it right to heal him on the Sabbath day? because they wanted to get something on the Lord. They, they didn't care about the man. They didn't, they didn't give a hoot about him. They just wanted to, to, to trap the Lord. So he said, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep if it fall in a pit on the Sabbath day will not lay hold and lift it out? He said, if your sheep falls in a hole, you're going to help him out even if it's Sabbath day. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then said he to the man, stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Can you imagine what a miracle? I mean, you're watching somebody, and they got this withered hand, and all of a sudden, it's just like the other hand. I've, I've seen people with jokes, and they say, here's this guy with this withered hand, and the faith healer comes and says, be healed. And the other hand goes like that. But that's not the way it is with the Lord. Then he said to the man, stretch forth your hand. He stretched it forth and was restored. And the Pharisees went out and held a council how they might destroy him. Can you see that? I mean, you just couldn't please these people. 
You can't make a critic happy. So you cannot allow yourself to be critical because you are going to be the most unhappy person in the world. Look at verse 22. When they, there was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. This man couldn't see, couldn't hear, and he healed him. And so much of the blind and dumb both spoke and saw. What a miracle. Don't you wish we could do that today? And all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Notice, notice how wicked they are. I mean, no matter what Jesus did, he, he heals, a, uh, he raises a little girl from the dead, and they didn't like that. He gives blind people their sight, didn't like that. Guy's got a withered hand, didn't like that. Heals a leper, they didn't like that. They didn't like anything. You know why? Because they allowed themselves to become critical. No matter what you do, you can't make a critic happy. Look in 1 Samuel chapter 17. In 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 26, David spoke to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? And who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He should defy the armies of the living God. David goes out to take some food to his brothers. His father sends him on his, on his errand. He says, go take these cheeses, take this bread, take it to your brothers. They're up there in the army. And he gets out there, and here's this giant, and he's out there cursing God. And he's cursing the armies of Israel. And he's telling them, because one of you come on over here and we'll fight. And if, and if you win, we'll be your servants. And if I win, you'll be our servant. Nobody won in any parts of this guy. I mean, this guy is huge. I mean, he is like the Hulk Hogan of the Philistines. Nobody wants to mess with this guy. So David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who does he think he is? And what will they give the person goes out there and kills him? And the people told him what it was. And verse 28, and he, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why camest thou down hither? With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness of thy heart. Thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. So here's Eliab. He's the oldest brother. He's the biggest. He's the strongest. And when Samuel came to anoint one of Jesse's sons, the king, the first one he saw was Eliab. And he figured, this has got to be him. This guy, I mean, he's, he's the man. But God says, listen. That's not the one. He said, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So it goes all the way down all the list of brothers, and finally there's David. And they said, you got any more sons? Well, we got David. He's out watching the sheep. Nobody even considered David. He was the unlikely one. They said, well, call him. They brought him in. God said, he's the one. They anointed him king. Well, listen, don't you think Eliab... Had a hard time with that? Don't, don't you think there was some jealousy there? I mean, talk about sibling rivalry. So now here is this younger brother, this kid brother, and he comes down, and Eliab says, I know your pride. I know your naughtiness of your heart. You're just here. You think you're a big shot. You just, you just think you're somebody. Well, you know what he's doing? He's questioning David's motives. He's critical of David, and he's questioning his motives. You know, that's the hardest thing to defend. When you know your motives are right, and you know your motives are pure, but people criticize why you're doing what you're doing. That's, that's, a, that's a hard thing to, to, to defend. When we were in the old ATCO building, and we, were, we bought the ground, and we were going to build this building, we had a man at church, and he moved away now. And he was doing everything in his power to try to make Brother Charlie and I look bad. And what he was saying was, and he told us this, he said, you just want to have a sign out on the pike with your name on it. Well, we've been here 15 years. I still don't have my name out there. I don't have my picture out there, and I don't want my picture out there. It's bad enough you go in the diner and you look at the face mat, and you, there's your picture. 
But how do you defend that? It's, it's, it's harder to defend your motives than it is your actions. But his brother was totally critical. You got to be careful about being critical because a critical spirit is contagious. Look over in Romans chapter 16. It's easy to criticize leadership. People always criticize leadership. That's where criticism always ends up going to. But you got to be careful about that. Criticism in a church is like cancer in the body. It spreads. You know, we're, we're cautious about COVID. There's more COVID going around again. And uh, we don't want to give it to anybody. We don't want to catch it. And you got to be careful. And everybody understands that. Well, let me just tell you something. we got to be careful about our spirit. we got to be careful about being critical because, again, if we're critical with our children, our children are going to end up being critical. And if we're critical in church, if we're not careful, listen, listen Henny Penny was dead wrong. This guy was not falling. But all her friends, she convinced them that it was, and they really believed it was, even though it wasn't. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Now listen, in your life, in your family, where you work, where you go to school, church, there's always going to be critical people. There's always going to be negative people. And you know what the Bible says? Just stay away from them. Don't hang out with them because you don't want to catch what they have. Just that simple. I'm not trying to be mean to anybody or act like I'm against anybody or anything, but I don't want to have that spirit. I don't want to be in on all those negative talks. I don't want to be in on all those critical conversations. I want to talk to somebody that talks about the Lord, talks about the Bible. I mentioned this before, but Jim Petruzzi uh, calls me almost every day, and, and we have spiritual talks. We talk about Bible things and God things. And that's the way I want to keep it. I don't want to be talking about everything that's wrong in the world. Let me give you the last thought. Don't get bitter. You start out positive. Next thing you know, if you're not careful, you're negative, and then you get critical, and then the worst thing can happen in your whole life is you're going to get bitter. People get bitter. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 6, and this is the last verse I'm going to turn to. 2 Samuel chapter number 6, verse number 14. David danced before the Lord. He wasn't doing the soul train. He wasn't doing boogie-woogie. He was just praising God. And uh, he did it with all his might. Whatever do we do for the Lord, we ought to do it with all our might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of the trumpet. They were bringing the ark home. The Philistines had captured the ark, and the ark was where the mercy seat is, and uh, the, the tablets were in the ark, and it was in the Holy of Holies. It was sacred. And bringing this home, this was a big day. I mean, this is a big thing. It'd be kind of like... I don't, there's nothing we can compare it to. I remember the first day we, when we came in this church and we dedicated this building. I remember how, how excited we were and how joyful we were. Well, you just multiply that time 100. So here he is and everybody's rejoicing with him. And uh, there's shouting and the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Here everybody's celebrating. The trumpets are trumpeting, the dancers are dancing, the singers are singing, everybody's joyful, everybody's happy, but not everybody. Michael despised him in her heart. Now listen to me, this was her husband. This was her husband. When they started out, before David had married Michael, the Bible says Michael loved David. Now something was going on. This didn't, hey listen, this just wasn't 
going from this uh, paradise, adventures in paradise, to she despised him in her heart. There, there was stuff going on for a long time. She started out with the right attitude. She was happy. She was joyful. And whatever was going on, next thing you know, she was getting pretty negative, and then she got critical, and now she's bitter. Maybe she's holding a grudge. You know, her father had been king, and David replaced her father. You know, most young ladies, as they're growing up, they have a father. Not everybody does today, I understand that, but a lot of times in a young lady's life, she looks up to her father. And then the father who gives this woman in marriage, her mother and I, and all of a sudden she's got a husband. And maybe the husband just didn't treat her like the father. I don't know what was going on, but I know that she got bitter. And it ended up being a tragedy. We got to be careful about that. We were in the Methodist building, and I talk about it a lot, but they were good days, they're good memories. It's probably about 1985, 1986, and we had a revival meeting from Sunday to Sunday. And we had meetings every morning and every night. And people came, believe it or not. They weren't playing soccer back then like they are now and baseball and all the other junk that people put before the Lord. We just had a tent meeting, great tent meeting. If you missed it, you missed a great blessing. So it was Saturday. We'd had the meeting Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The meeting just kept building and building and building. Saturday morning, I mean, the Lord just came in that place. I mean, people were getting saved. We probably had 10 or more people saved. The altar was filled. Everybody was shouting. Everybody's hugging each other. We're having this great time. I got excited, and I climbed up on the pulpit. And I was standing on the pulpit leading singing. And the uh, Bible said Ezra got up on the pulpit, by the way. That's why I read that earlier, kind of defend myself. <laughs> so I couldn't even get up on this pulpit. Now I need a ladder to get up there. <laughs> but it was just great. I mean, it's just great. And closed the meeting in prayer. People where everybody's hanging around. One lady come up to me, and I could hardly hear her for the noise. People were still shouting and going on. And she said, what am I going to tell my son? And I thought she'd talk about the revival. You know, like, what happened? What is this going on here? This is the Lord. This is God. I said, what? She said, what am I going to tell my son? When he stands on the furniture. You know what she was saying? See, you got up and you stood on that pulpit, and now my son's going to think it's okay to stand on the furniture. What am I going to tell him because the preacher does it? Can I just tell you something? She totally missed it. I'm not saying I should have stood on the pulpit. I'm not saying it's okay for people to stand on furniture. But I'm saying, listen, we're having revival. People are getting saved. The Lord's meeting with us. And, and you missed it. You know why we miss it? Because we have the wrong spirit. People come today, you don't get blessed. Other, listen, two people can sit in the same pew, and one can be rejoicing and blessed and happy, and the other person goes walking out with a sour look. Same church, same singing, same preacher, same everything. You know, the Bible talks about a sower went forth to sow. And some of that seed brought forth a hundredfold. Some of it, the, the, the briars ate it up. And some of it fell on rocks and, and nothing happened. Well, listen, let me tell you something. It, it wasn't the sower and it wasn't the seed. It was the soil. Where are you? Do you have a positive spirit? You got your eyes on the Lord? The joy of the Lord is our strength. God is good. Life is good. Are you getting negative? I hope you're not critical, and I pray to God you're not bitter. But if you're not positive, you need to get back to positive. Like the prodigal left the pig pen, leave where you are and get back to positive. 
God is in control. The sky is not falling. Whatever your problems, God's bigger than your problems. Brother Charlie.